I'm Scott Isle Miller, and this is my life living in Nicaragua. Today, we're going to take a different approach because our topic is thinking outside of the box when coming to living in Nicaragua. And so we're going to think outside the box as we approach our video for today. And actually, it's not that different, but it's very different for me. So join me after the bump as we explore how thinking outside the box, taking a different mental approach to your life, to your needs, to what you're going to do, could be the difference between success and not being so happy here in Nicaragua. So Dale sent in a, a comment. He comments a lot of days. Uh, I'm not going to track it down because it's impossible to find things in YouTube, but he, he lives on Ometepe. And for those of you who know, know that instantly by saying that, that means he's already thinking outside the box just in where he lives. It's an island with about 50, 55,000 people living in the middle of Lago Nicaragua. It's very isolated. Its only connection to the mainland is a ferry or series of ferries. There's some small ones called launches but there's just these occasional boats that go between the island and the mainland. Now they go regularly and some people do commute. If you're not actually cut off from civilization. If you stay there at night, you're cut off for 12 hours, but that's about it. If you have a major storm, you're cut off. Uh, <laughs> see our videos when Kat went there for uh, some time and got trapped for several days, but she did enjoy her time. Ometepe is beautiful, it's a great place to live, and if you're looking for something really unique, it might fit the bill. It's only going to take so many people, though, before it becomes a bizarre metropolis stranded on a little island in the middle of a lake. That could happen. All right, so Ometepe. So Dale lives out there, and he's got, I'm not going to go through all of his things. That's not the point, is not to solve his problems. He, was, he was, wasn't was writing to get solutions. He was writing about, here's some of the challenges he faces as a response to the video on Culture Shock two days ago. And so if you're going to be on Ometepe, yeah, it's going to up Culture Shock compared to other places because it, even for Nicaragua, is an extremely unique location with its own challenges. Nicaraguans moving to Ometepe might experience culture shock on their own. One of the things he writes about though, and, and this really I think highlights where you can broadly think outside the box here in Nicaragua, is he can't find high quality dog food on Ometepe. That kind of goes without saying, but you may not think about that. So if you have a dog out there, you're going to need to struggle to get dog food. Now, he talks about bringing dog food in through Honduras, through Alta Gracia, and doing a bunch of stuff, uh, which is a lot of work and costs quite a bit of money because it's coming from very far away. Living here in the country, I do know that if you're looking for kibble, traditional dry dog food, that you can get high quality dog food at Price Mart in Managua. So in theory, even if you live on Ometepe, you're not out of luck. You need to send someone or a service to Price Mart where they're going to pick up the dog food for you and ship it to Ometepe. And of course, people do that because there's a lot of people in Dale's boat, pun intended, uh, where you need to get products from around the country or potentially internationally and get them onto Ometepe. And you don't want to spend your entire time traveling, which if Dale was to go out looking for dog food on his own, it would require him to get up in the morning, go to the port, get on a ferry, take a one to two hour ferry ride, end up in Rivas, because right now the ferry to uh, Granada is suspended. From there, if he doesn't own a car that he has parked on the mainland, which would be super inconvenient in general, he has to take a bus for hours to Managua. Then he can take a taxi, get to Price Mart, go shopping, wait in the 20 minute line, get back in a taxi, get back to the bus station, get back to the port. And you can imagine where it goes from there. This is a big process all for one really large bag of dog food that might be very hard to move around even if you manage to do all that. So this is a potentially difficult process. So there's a reason why services exist for this and you may need to leverage them or you may need to take a big truck uh, and do a special trip, get loaded up with stuff and be good for months at a time and just put a bunch of effort in. Like there's things you can do, of course. But we need to think outside the box. We need to think more broadly about how you can approach uh, anything in Nicaragua because all the factors are different. It's not just that dog food is difficult to get or that the store is far away. Those are individual problems that he faces because he's on Ometepe. If you lived in Managua, getting dry kibble from Ometepe would be, or I'm sorry, from Price Mart would be very simple. You wouldn't have a problem with that. So not a big deal. But if you're looking for 
uh, a way to solve this problem. Of course, he could use a service, but maybe he doesn't like the dog food. Let's imagine that Price Mart's dog food isn't to his liking or his dog's allergic to something in it. They don't have a large selection. They still just have one or two things of dog food. One is pretty good. One is mediocre. Uh, so I would, I would easily end up in a situation where I had dogs and they didn't like that food. I'm lucky that my dogs do like the Price Mart food. And even if we offer them higher quality food, they snub their noses at it for I don't know why, but they do. So we use the Price Mart food and it's great and it's no problems at all. But it's easy to imagine a scenario where you would need to do something else. So what can you do? Well, you can do what he's looking at doing, ship food in from another country. Some things come in from Costa Rica. Some things come in from uh, Honduras. And there's some things you just have to do that with, right? You need a specialty piece of electronics. There's no way to work around it. Well, that's what you're going to do. And I'm constantly bringing things in from the United States for exactly that purpose. But uh, when you're looking at something like dog food, Let's try thinking outside the box. Let's put a Nicaraguan thinking cap on and maybe approach this in a different direction. And it depends what you want to do. depends on a lot of factors. I'm not saying this is a solution for him, but it's a solution idea that someone needs to think about if they're looking at something like this. So if you look at the cost uh, of getting a bag of dog food, I think he said it was something like 1600 Cordoba, which is like $40, $45. And that's pretty expensive. And I don't know how many bags of dog food his dogs are going to go through in a month, but let's say two. So you may be looking at $90 worth of dog food a month. Now, if you're someone like us, uh, we have... And this is also thinking outside the box, right? And we talked about this in other episodes, so most of you are aware, but there's a ton of new people, so let's talk about it. So when we moved from the inner city, we moved in, uh, we used to live in La Borio, which is part of the inner barrios of Leon, and now we live in Sutiava, which is pretty far out. And we live farther out, like we're not in like really close to the city, Sutiava. So one of the things we were concerned about is when we lived in La Barria, we could walk to most of the restaurants in the city. And when we took a cab, it'd be super close. And it was just really easy to get the things. And of course, delivery was fantastic. As we moved out, we knew that delivery would remain available, but the times for things would get longer. Sometimes there'd be an extra charge. A few things would refuse to come out. So we knew we were going to lose some there, but our ability to walk to restaurants basically all went away. There's one or two places we could go to, but it's all Nicaraguan food. We're vegetarians. Very little of it is something that we can actually eat. So that doesn't work out very well for us. So we knew we had to think more broadly when coming out here. We also lost our ability to walk to the supermarket, which is something we used to do regularly. I would go with the kids, load up, and I would carry 12 bags of groceries back through the streets because it's not that far and I don't like getting in a taxi. So that's something we gave up. When we came out uh, to Sutiava, one of the discussions we had was, well, how much uh, less are we going to pay being in a lower cost barrio? That was fantastic. We saved a little bit of money, uh, a bit actually, probably one or $200 a month overall between lower cost electric and lower cost rent. So a, a pretty solid gain uh, financially. And then, of course, we thought about, well, what are we going to do about food? Because we used to be able to, yeah, of course, we could cook at home, but we liked to go out to eat. It was a regular part of our routine. Uh, and it kept us with variety of food, which is very important to us. So we were looking at how do we maintain a variety, uh, but not get super expensive? Because what are we going to do? A lot of places don't deliver, by the way. Some of the places we like most, say Sua, for example, while relatively expensive, doesn't offer a delivery option. So uh, try Trying to do that is very problematic. Um, we could pay for custom delivery, of course, but then you're getting even more expensive and even more work. You can do things like pay a taxi to go basically anywhere and get anything you want. But is as a one-time thing, no problem at all. As a regular thing to just be like, hey, call my taxi and have them go pick me up dinner, no, you're going to pay way too much, right? Five to eight dollars extra on a meal, which if you're feeding 20 people and it's one special occasion and you really want that one restaurant, fine. But if it's going to be a, you know, a couple times a week, ooh, even a one or two dollar extra charge starts to be noticeable for most people. So that's not something you really want to do. So what was our thinking outside the box? Well, we sat down and said, you know, we pay a cleaner already. We could hire someone who does a little bit more or hire a second person one way or another, have a cook whose job is to cook around the house. Our cleaner was part-time when we lived in La Barria. We didn't need someone six days a week. We needed someone two to three days a week, although cleaning every day would be nicer, didn't need it. 
it is nice in Nicaragua. So things that people don't think about, tile floors and the way that just life is here in the tropics, things get dusty. Uh, we have a lot of open air. It's a dusty area. We get dust from the Sahara for real. That's an actual thing. So you clean all the time. Uh, that's a natural part of life in the tropics, constant cleaning. But cleaning isn't very hard. You can sweep, you can mop. It's not like vacuuming uh, in most cases. So having someone three days a week is fine, but six would be nice. Moving out to the country, we said, well, you know, for the extra money, it's we could get someone who would go and do the shopping at the grocery store and cook for us. And instead of just uh, solving the restaurant problem, it would cause us to, instead of having uh, just as good as cheap delivery, it would potentially keep us from going out to eat a lot of the time and lower the cost by having them do the grocery shopping. They can probably get better prices than we can because they can go to the market. They can haggle. They're not going to get gringo priced. So they can buy groceries at lower cost. They can do the cooking in the house. They can reduce our chances of going out to eat in total. So instead of being higher cost in Labo Rio uh, and moving to an even higher cost in Sutiava, it could lower our cost. Well, that was pretty cool. And then as an added bonus, well, my wife doesn't really like to cook very often. Once a week, fine. But two, three, four times a week, she starts to be pretty unhappy about it. So having someone who is going to cook several days a week and we only need to cook at home once a week and we still want to go out to eat sometimes uh, takes a huge load off and makes the family happier. We don't need to go cook for ourselves. When we do, it's because we want to, not because we have to. And so there's this huge win in culture, like our home culture. There is potentially a drop in price. And, and between not going out to eat as often and having more free time and flexibility to do things at home, like we don't have to be there at a certain time to cook for the kids or whatever. They can order food anytime they want. Um, not just eliminating food at dinner, but it could be anytime during the day. Like there's just food can be made. I can have food made for me in the office so I can spend more time working and earn more money rather than spending my time making myself food or just going without. It can order healthier food that takes a little bit more effort rather than running out. Because for me, you guys probably notice I'm very busy. I work a full-time job and I'm a full-time YouTuber. If I need to eat in the middle of the day, that's a problem. I don't have 30 minutes to go prepare myself a healthy snack. Like that would be great, but I don't have that time in a day. I would have to give up something that I'm doing somewhere. Work would be missed. And it could just be that I'm making fewer shows, but that doesn't help anybody, right? We're, we're really at a point where if I go and cook, and I'm not good at cooking, I don't enjoy cooking, it doesn't, you know, it's not cathartic for me or anything, it's stressful. It's me going, why am I doing this instead of being productive? It makes me really unhappy, not just because I don't like cooking, but I really don't like doing something that's unproductive, and that's exactly what it would be. So in reality, like today, I would run out, grab a packet of crackers and a can of tuna, and eat that. Now, it's a really good tuna, it's like smoked tuna with some veggies, it's fantastic, it's very, very delicious, and this particular one was relatively healthy, so that was a good example, but that kind of thing. If I don't have something quick to grab, I'm going to grab chips. I'm going to grab whatever is easy. And if that's not a healthy thing, then I'm going to eat something really unhealthy because I don't have time to track down what there is healthy to eat. And I'm constantly, if I do find anything, it turns out someone was saving it for some recipe and then it wasn't marked. And how was I to know? But I have to run in and grab something out of the kitchen really quickly. So, uh, so it's very problematic. So this solved a lot of things. Suddenly, it's we're not going out to eat and the groceries are cheaper and we're much happier at home and we're getting healthier food and just win, 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 win. And at the end of the day, when you add it all up, we're not sure we're actually paying anything. The savings are so dramatic that we may actually be slightly saving money versus not having a cook at home, which sounds like about the craziest thing you've ever heard. But welcome to Nicaragua, where the prices for everything are far outside what you're imagining. And when you adjust for Nicaraguan thinking and really put it all into perspective, there's a very real possibility that some completely alternative approach you would never think of might make sense. That was a big setup for, let's go back to Dale's dog food scenario and say, well, Dale, what about the option of, one, having a cook that's already in your house and cooks for the animal, or hire someone, because this could be very part-time, uh, that cooks really, really good healthy food for your dogs? When I lived in Geneseo, New York, you guys, I'm not wearing it now, but sometimes I wear the Geneseo hat, the black one that says Geneseo. Uh, we had uh, the sweetest Boston Terrier. His name was Oreo. Uh, this is 20 years ago. We got him, well, 19 years ago we got him. And uh, he had a severe blood problem, hyperlipidemia, and uh, 
it. He could, and he was poisoned from. Uh, there was a rat food in the dog food supply thing uh, many many years ago, and he was the first dog saved in Manhattan uh, when that happened. So he made it on the news. He was famous. He was in the Bostonian, all kinds of things. Uh, but because of those things, he was never able to uh, eat. Uh, prepared food ever again. We could never take a risk with him. And he he had really specific uh, health requirements. So we basically were in a position where we always had to cook for him. He had to have really lean cuts of healthy uh, chicken. He had to have rice, things like that. And, um, and, and it actually turned out to be not that bad. We could buy really good chicken, really good rice, do all these things, cook it at home. My father would come by and be like, wow, that's fantastic. We're vegetarian, but he's not. And we'd be like, add some salt to it, and you've got a really healthy stew right there. And sometimes he'd eat it, right? Not very often, but sometimes. And he'd always be like, wow, it's really, like, you're making really good food for that dog. And uh, and it kept the dog really healthy. We knew exactly what he was getting. Um, the whole thing was fantastic. Well, there's no reason you couldn't do exactly the same thing. There in Ometepe, find one of the neighbors that, or someone who wants a full-time job. You're going to have them clean and do other things for you. Or just hire someone who's going to work part-time. There could be a neighbor, and uh, you, you just hire them for one day a week. They prepare the dog food. They put it in plastic containers, and you freeze it for the other days, or it stays for several, like whatever you need to do. Uh, and... And that might be a really simple solution. Is it going to be cheaper than getting bagged dog food? Uh, who knows? But is it going to be really close in price, really convenient, and super healthy? Yeah. So that's an approach you might want to think about. And the point isn't to tell Dale this is a great idea for you. That doesn't – it might be, but I doubt it. Uh, the point is that – in Nicaragua so often, the things you have to do are think outside the box. It's kind of like we had, um, and, and this is just some troll, so I know this isn't serious, but, you know, in many cases, people asked, well, how? How am I supposed to know uh, about a new rule or something in the country if it's not posted on a website? And they're, of course, thinking inside the box. They're thinking, as a North American, there would always be a website that has a list of this. Actually, that's not true. I I'm from the United States, and half the time there's no way to get that information. So the expectation is a false one, which is partially why this is trolling. But here in Nicaragua, you have to think like a Nicaraguan in this case and stop thinking, well, this is how I would want it done. Therefore, if it's not done that way, something's wrong. Well, no. This is Nicaragua, and they have a process for this. And in this particular example, that process is call the person in charge and ask. It's that simple. Now, that's not what people want. They want to look at a website and then be able to link that to other people. I understand, and that's what I would prefer myself, but I don't have the right to demand that. I only have the right to go on my on my YouTube channel and say, here's an idea that might work, but I don't know how you'll pull it off because there's no infrastructure for this. But if there was, this would be a great way to do it. But it's not like the information isn't available. It's not like you can't check. It's that you have to stop thinking from an American context, a North American context, and saying, if it's not done this way, it doesn't work, you need to sometimes think completely differently about problems and other places where this comes in, right? So for example, I use an iPhone. I have it right here, my iPhone, iPhone 13, hopefully getting a 16 this year. I got to get a 16 this year. I'm hoping this one makes it long enough that I don't have to get a 15 in the interim. And I definitely pay a premium and take on a bunch of effort and have to go to the United States every time I'm going to get an iPhone. That's just something I put up with. I know that those are limitations or uh, extra problems that I'm creating, and I live with that, and that's completely of my own creation. So that's fine. Uh, but for most people, when you're coming here, something I would say is uh, instead of bringing your phone with you, or certainly bring one you have, but don't feel tied to it. Come down and switch to the kinds of phones that they make available here, which may require a little bit of, um, you know, uh, adjusting to things. But there are plenty of very good phones sold here. In fact, my top choice phones outside of Apple are all sold here. If I was going to be on Android, I wouldn't want to go to the U.S. and pay extra for a phone. I could get a better phone for cheaper here. That's what I prefer to do. Even if it ends up not being actually cheaper, it was slightly more expensive. Well, I know it can get repaired here. I know there's parts here. I know there's a dealer here. I know just there's things. The infrastructure is different. So thinking a little bit differently about what we buy, what we use, how we do it can go a long way. And another great example is a lot of people really want to bring down uh, cars. They want to import a car that they already own. Or a lot of people actually want to buy a car in the U.S. and be like, I'm just going to buy it in the U.S. and import it to Nicaragua, which I don't understand why people want to do that even for the U.S. That's not actually thinking inside the box. That's a pretty wacky thing too, but a lot of people want to do that. But there's a lot of reasons why it doesn't make sense and and just think in a different context, well, I'm going to be in Nicaragua. Maybe what they have in Nicaragua is going to work better for me. 
and don't think of buying a car, buying a house in the way that you would in North America, come down and think, how would a Nicaraguan solve this problem? Right? Oh, I can't use a real estate agent. That's not the way things work. How would a Nicaraguan solve this problem? Oh, they're going to walk around, call people. Now, in this case, that's not thinking outside the Nicaraguan box. It's thinking very much inside of it. <clears throat> but from an American perspective, from a Canadian perspective, these are very different approaches that we're not expecting. And so it's really uh, important to either uh, uh, simply approach things like a Nicaraguan would or to give ourselves the flexibility to let go of our context and say, okay, here's what I would have done. But maybe I, I need to think about my goal instead of the means to that goal. Because when you're living in, we'll say, the United States, you, you're familiar with tried and true mechanisms to solve a given problem. In Dale's situation, I want dog food. There's a store in the corner. I can walk there, buy it, and walk home. That's how I solve it. I don't have to think how I'm going to meet my goal because the means are so obvious and simple. But here in Nicaragua, your goal is to feed your dog well with healthy food and keep him happy and healthy. So that's the goal. That's the, We have to start with that. Instead of saying, I can't get the dog food. No, you can't get the dog food. Do you need dog food? Oh, wait, no. Why does my dog need to eat dog food? Why doesn't he eat human food that we just make sure is proper for dogs? That's actually how you do the best food for your dog. And okay, let's look up recipes, find really good healthy dog food that's appropriate for the dog in question. Just have it made locally, instead of having brought in the United States, you'd be like, right, can you do that? And of course you can, but it'd be so expensive, so so big of an effort. You'd be like, well, okay, yeah, but not realistically. We did, but a lot of people wouldn't. But here in Nicaragua, that might be the simplest. It may even be the cheapest solution. There's no reason not to do that. And uh, uh, there's no reason not to go door to door and ask people about property, ask neighbors if they know of someone. That's how people do it. We need to think in a completely different context, and that will empower us. And then as we do that, we'll get better and better at it. All right. And you'll be, you'll be once you're here and, and as an everyday thing, stop and say, okay, wait, I'm trying to solve this thing. So if I was in the United States and I need, this is a new thing going on, right? I'm getting a new new studio here. I'm sitting in my studio. Um, I did some shorts. If you want to see like what the studio looks like, I did them while there's still daylight. I've got the new podcasting station. That's what this table is that you're seeing right here behind me. That's not normally there. Um, I'm starting to do some podcast stuff, getting interviewed. I'm doing a couple. I'm on uh, my Latin life twice coming up in a week or so. Uh, so I need to be set up to do those interviews. Um, I'm, I've got some other stuff going on. So I'm starting to do that. And I'm doing more of these, the lives. This isn't live, but I do more of the lives that kind of look like this. I'm sitting here. Um, and I want to be able to do it in my, my really beautiful studio space with the Madeira wall and the neon signs and uh, just up the game, right? But I don't have like the right space and cabling. And so in the U.S., I would buy new desks and do like all these things. Because I would be able to go to the store and buy those things. Well, I can't go to the store and buy reasonable new desks here. And that's like, oh, this huge challenge. What are we going to do? Oh, wait, I'm just going to call my handyman and say, can you, here's what I want, build me a studio with all these things I need, shelves and, and tables and all this stuff. Well, I said that today. He already went, got the wood. He's going to start tomorrow. And, and we got this all kinds of new stuff is going to be happening in here. Like, oh, that's a really simple solution. And it's going to cost a fraction of what... It would be to buy tables, but that's so not how we would approach it in North America. We would never be like, I'm going to hire a carpenter and have him build everything unless we were like millionaires and we're like, ah, custom furniture, I can afford that. Right here, that's the cheap approach. Let's just get some decent wood and start making what makes sense and, and make it exactly as we need. You actually are getting a better solution. I can get something custom that actually fits the room rather than, well, this is as close as I could get at Office Depot and it mostly works. And, you know, sure, Office Depot has nice furniture, but it's not the right furniture for you. It's just they have decent furniture and it will work for you. This is going to be really good, I think. I'm, I'm quite excited about how we're going to alter this room and make it way more productive and, and be great. And of course, I was very much like, I don't know how to approach this. I don't know how to solve these problems very well. And uh, I still don't know what I'm going to buy. And and Paul's like, just tell Jeppe to build it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's that's a good solution. So those are just some examples of, of ways that we can approach things differently. And others uh, that came up while I just took a break real quickly to eat dinner. And someone was, was saying... Uh, about their concerns in driving here in Nicaragua. And absolutely, this is something that we mention quite often that uh, you may want to reconsider driving if you have the option, especially if you're going to be here as a tourist. If you're going to live here, then 
often driving makes sense. But if you're going to be here as a tourist, you don't have a lot of time. You're only here for two weeks, three weeks. You don't want to really take any risks and deal with uh, having to deal with police or insurance or whatever. It's probably just not worth it. Uh, the cost savings, the flexibility of having a car generally doesn't make a lot of sense. Okay. But uh, so often, um, coming from North America, we're so inside the box. We drive, right? We have a car. We want that flexibility, put our stuff in it. And there's reasons why that's great. But uh, here in Nicaragua, it is really common um, to use taxis, use public transportation. But let's say you need something that's more flexible, like having your own car, but you don't want to be driving. Well, and we do talk about this a bit. This shouldn't come as a surprise. But this is a great example of generally a North American isn't going to think of this. And if you live in Nicaragua, you start to say, oh, you know, I could just hire a driver who has a car and they will supply the car and they'll drive and I'll pay for the gas and I'll just come up with like a daily rate. And if you want them to be super flexible, especially if you're on vacation, you just have a little bit of time, heck, pay for them to stay in a hotel room next to yours, have them eat at a restaurant with you like that. Take it to the to the extreme and be like, how much is that really going to cost uh, versus uh, renting a car and driving myself. Well, you're going to pay for gas in the rental anyway. Do the math and you may be looking at actually extremely little extra money or you may be looking at at least an amount of money that is well worth it for the flexibility and the, and the comfort and the, the uh, predictability of your time and solving a bunch of things and just having this know-how and who knows how many other benefits come with having a person that's looking after you for two, three, four days, maybe a week or two. And you only need to hire them when you need to go somewhere. You don't need to hire them to be every day. Like you're probably going to arrive on some day and not travel that day, or leave some day, not travel that day, maybe have days that you're staying somewhere, don't need a driver all that time. So, you, you know, minimize that, maybe take a taxi or have things delivered, walk some the other time, whatever. The point is, is that uh, so often we assume we got to have a car and this can be got to buy a house, right? All these things are there's there's this uh, rigidity with coming from anywhere, right? We have rigidity from our context, whatever that context is, and we all vary. So I have different rigidities than you have. That's the nature of things. But we all bring these rigidities, these assumptions, these what our box contains. And especially Nicaragua really tends to exist outside that box. And when we accept that we have to think outside that box, um, Often, really good, simple, practical solutions often present themselves. And we're able to solve our goals, in this case, transportation. I want to flexibly be able to get from place to place on my own schedule, directly stop whenever I want, smell the roses, take pictures, whatever. And, of course, there's going to be someone who needs to think inside the box and say, look, I, I exhausted all the options. I got to drive myself. That's eh, fine. But considering the other options is often going to be something much better because uh, there just there just are a different set of options in nearly every different aspect uh, of life here. And so uh, it it takes some getting used to. It takes practice. And it takes, I think, in most cases, kind of a conscious acceptance that I need to and this is good things for just humans, right? This isn't a Nicaragua experiment. You should be doing this regardless, but this is a case where it's going to push you. You should be saying, here's my goals with everything in life. Instead of here's the means I think will get to a goal I don't want to articulate, articulate your actual goal and say, okay, how do I obtain that goal best? And in your home context, you, you make yourself efficient by already knowing the, the answer to that in almost all cases. But in Nicaragua, there's a really good chance you're not going to already know the, the process that makes the most sense. And so approach it from a, I just have to get to this goal. It doesn't matter what I do in between as long as I get to that goal. How do I do that? And another great example that we talk about all the time is so many people just assume you have to have residency. That's a, but what's the goal? goal residency isn't a goal. Residency itself is never a goal. Not the, not the visa of residency, which is what people are talking about. Residency as in I want to reside in Nicaragua in this example. Uh, yes, that is a goal. I want to 
spend my time in Nicaragua. Okay, in that sense of residency, yes, that is a goal. But to obtain that residency, the right for myself to stay in Nicaragua, do I have to? And there's all these assumptions. You can hear my dogs running around in here. There's all these assumptions that you that people have. I have to have this visa. I have to get it before I arrive. I have to own a house. I need to invest in a business. Instead of starting with all these things you think you have to do because you're imagining this residency means something that it doesn't, start by articulating your goal. Okay, I want to permanently or semi-permanently reside in Nicaragua. That's, that's a great goal. Okay, great. You want the right to stay, and, and I don't want to worry about things. Great. Do you need any of these things to get there? Oh, well, let's start with... Okay, there was a car accident directly in front of my house, right as I said that. I just heard them slam into each other and their, their horn going. Okay, so do any of the things that I was assuming get me to that point? Do I need to have residency visa? Well, why would you assume so? Is there something you're trying to overcome? You have the right to come without one, right? Okay, yeah. Well, you have the right to stay without one, don't you? Oh, yeah. Well, why are you adding that? You've already achieved your goal. You're, you're past that point. Well, you don't need another thing. Oh, 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 oh. Well, but I have to own a house, right, to be able to – well, didn't you already achieve your goal without owning a house? Oh, oh yeah, I guess I'm already at my goal, right? Like it's, you got to think and it's completely different. To, like there really are so many assumptions that we bring. And this is just a human thing. Nicaragua just exposes a lot of things that we often do because there's so many things that are outside of our natural context that it really does – often throw people off a lot. And it exposes when people are process thinking instead of goal thinking. Because in normal life, in your as long as you're inside your own context, you're in your hometown, you're not doing things outside of your norm, you're not a business person, very often you can ignore your goals and often do okay because the tried and true processes are tried and true for a reason. So in most aspects of life, we can get away with thinking inside the box almost all the time. That's why it is inside the box. If, if that didn't work, it wouldn't be the box. It would, it would, you'd have to change. Now, this is, as a business consultant, this is something I run into every day. People who only think inside the box generally fail at business because business succeeds outside the box. Inside the box, there's a million people doing the thing inside the box. You have to be so lucky, generally rich, and, and just inherit the box to have any real chance of just going by a predetermined path and succeeding. It is knowing when and how and to exit that path, to think outside the box and to think more broadly, to find your goals and find alternative means of getting there is what makes business successful. And as I'm doing this, my broken office chair has just descended six inches, so I'm working really hard to stay on camera. But that is really my topic for today. Nicaragua really does bring out the value in being flexible into thinking broadly and pushes you uh, to think of everything in terms of goal thinking. This is great, though. This is a wonderful topic that people should really uh, grab onto and say this is a way of approaching life that makes you far more successful. It gives you far more options. And it really does um, just open doors when you're like, oh, I, this is what I'm trying to do. I have all these ways to achieve that. And the one I was going to do might work. But is it best? Maybe I can do it for half the price. Maybe I'm going to do it twice as fast. Maybe I can just enjoy life more because this other thing is better. And you see it when people are like, oh, I'm, uh, we had this conversation last night on the live stream. Zane was like, um, well, I want, to, uh, I want to be able to buy a house in Nicaragua. So I'm going to work in the United States, save up, and then move to Nicaragua, and then work remotely from my, my house that I buy. That, that's a great idea. But why would you wait to buy the house? Why not, buy, why not move to Nicaragua and save up the money in Nicaragua? Because you would actually save faster. And it was like this thought of you can't make a decision, you can't make a change until, and it's consistent, until you buy a house. I would actually say, as a general rule of thumb, if anything in your mind ever makes you say, I have to wait until I buy a house, the chances that the thing you just said makes sense is very low. Um, there are very, very few things in life that benefit from waiting for you to buy a house. Generally, it's the other way around. Do whatever it is before you buy a house. Um, the buying a house is almost always the last thing. It may be a thing, but it's not going to be a leading thing. Nothing no in normal life starts with buying a house and then finding a job. Buy a house and then determine what you're going to do. Find a house. No. It's always come up with your job. Come up with your career. Come up with your country. Come up with your town. 
Do all those things. Come up with your lifestyle. Then find a house or build a house that satisfies your needs best. Don't come up with a structure in which you have to live and then mold your life around it. It's easy in real life to pick or build or modify a house to meet your needs. It is not easy to just fabricate a job, a town, a lifestyle, a culture, a weather that makes you happy. Those are not things you generally control or don't control a lot. But a house you generally do control a lot. And it's just not that big of a deal. And the only time that people really push you to have a house early is probably someone who sells a house. So thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. Let me know what you think of this format. This did really well the other day. So I'm going to sprinkle these in, see what we think. I enjoy doing these. It's kind of like a private podcast sort of thing, but it's good because it lets me make shows more quickly um, and, and at a different time of day. And we're working on this studio. I'm really excited about new studio work being done. And about the new podcast that, one, I'm being interviewed on uh, My Latin Life as part of the Nicaragua Roundtable, so check that out. And then a week later, I'm being interviewed one-on-one -on, -one on My Latin Life uh, as just part of a series on, on people who are uh, social media uh, content creators here in Nicaragua. And, uh, and then I'm going to be um, at least temporarily hosting uh, Latin American Living podcast, uh, also an audio show, but I, I like doing audio shows as well. Uh, and I've been doing that for a long time. So, uh, awesome. It's been, uh, it's been good. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in and joining me here. Uh, if you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That really does help a lot. And thank you so much. The, the response, uh, recently has been fantastic. Uh, the show's been doing fantastic as well. So thanks for, thanks for everybody for just tuning in and, and being a part of everything we do. And as always, Get down those comments, ask your questions, send in a video comment if you can. That would be amazing. Please, please, please do that. That would be just absolutely excellent. And uh, uh, yeah, share on social media. Tell your friends, family about the show, and I will see all of you tomorrow. And up on the screen, four videos. Please click on one. Please, please, please.